the first part of the talk is going to feel a bit like a bloodletting, right? But it's a bloodletting with a purpose. Because the problems that face our discipline admit of a solution. And by the end of the talk, I'll tell you what that solution is. But along the way, other fields should pay attention. Because the malady that plagues our discipline hasn't been quarantined to our borders. It's bled over into sociology, psychology, economics, all branches of the social sciences. Luckily, the remedy for us is the same as the remedy for them. So what's the problem? Well, for decade upon decade now, the science of crime has been guided by a single edict. When you're searching for the causes of crime, you should look only amongst the environment. Things like genes, brains, hormones, whatever effect those things may have, they come second to social processes, educational attainment, poverty. This has been the guiding force of our field. It's what we teach our students, even this very semester. Now, along the way, I'm going to talk about some reasons why that guiding edict is outmoded and wrong. But surely, if there's any amongst us who can change their mind, who can pivot to a new direction when presented with new evidence, it must be scientists. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. As the famous physicist Max Planck once pithily remarked, Science advances one funeral at a time. See, the problem is once certain dogmas and dogmatic people root themselves into the field, uh, a particular scientific field, it often does take, as Planck suggested, a string of eulogies to dislodge them. Now, in a bit of Planckian irony, one of the founding fathers of criminology, Italian physician Cesare Lombroso, also believed that biology and the environment mattered when you're trying to understand where crime comes from. But in the wake of Lombroso's eulogy came not an advance, but a regression. He's now our field's laughing stock. Lombroso, unfortunately for him, was both ahead of his time and a product of it. Many of his ideas about crime were wrong, but he was asking the right question. Why are people different? And it's a question we're still asking today, and, and lucky, luckily for us, it's an elegantly simple question that we can put into an equation and solve to get the right answer. And it's the only equation in the talk, I promise. So if we're interested in why people differ, right, we can look no further than these two factors. If we're trying to explain phenotypic variation, so variation in the things we can see, hair color, eye color, height, weight, behavior, personality. That variation is a product of genetic factors and the environment. Taken together, these two factors, genes and our experiences, explain why individuals in the population are taller than each other, shorter than each other, more outgoing, more personable, and even more violent and aggressive. But this is not the equation that criminology students learn. This is the equation that criminology students learn. The environment is all that matters. This is the one I was taught, and for so very long I was convinced that this had to be an accurate reflection of the world. But that started to unravel, and so I want to tell you a bit about how that happened. So I want you to do a thought experiment with me. Imagine that we could clone two individuals, make them uh, genetically identical to each other, and put them in different environments, from birth even. And then decades down the road after they'd had time to develop, we could examine them and see how similar or how different they are. Now for a wealth of reasons, both ethical and practical, we can't run this experiment, but as luck would have it, nature and some rare circum social circumstances have allowed us to examine just this type of research question. And that comes in the form of identical twins raised apart after being separated at birth. As it turns out, these individuals are remarkably similar to each other. Not just in their intellect and personality, 
but even the small idiosyncrasies that we feel like make us uniquely us, these individuals often had in common. Now this was a, a big development for me and, and very fascinating, but the, the research point that really stuck in my mind was the mere opposite of identical twins separated at birth and reared apart, and it had to do with research pertaining to adopted children raised together. These individuals share no DNA in common, only an environment. Now the reason this struck home was because I lived that research design. My brother and I were adopted at a very young age, and with the benefit of hindsight, I can look back and see all of the differences between us that were always there. Brothers in every sense of the word, except in the biological sense. And we love each other deeply, but our personalities, our intellects, our interests, and our hobbies, very different, despite decades together in the same home. Now, this was a bit like tumbling down a rabbit hole. All of the information I had been taught, the equation that I was led to believe, explained all of the human differences we observed in the science of crime. It didn't seem to hold anymore. But surely, there were some things that were beyond the reach of genes. Something. Well, that belief unraveled entirely for anyone still holding it this past year in one of the most remarkable papers I have ever seen published in the journal Nature Genetics. And I want to tell you just briefly what these uh, valiant researchers found. So meta-analysis, which is just a large study of a bunch of studies. And this particular meta-analysis examined twins. We've conducted a meta-analysis of virtually all twin studies published in the past 50 years on a wide range of traits and reporting on more than 14 million twin pairs across 39 different countries. A truly Herculean undertaking. So what did they find? Our results provide compelling evidence that all human traits are heritable. Not one trait had a weighted heritability estimate of zero. Now just let that wash across your synapses for a second. There is virtually nothing that is beyond the reach of genes. Now, why does this matter for criminology or psychology or sociology or any other branch of the social sciences? Well, to understand why, let's look at a basic social science research design. So these boxes are variables, right? Things that we think predict one another, cause and effect, if you will. So perhaps, as a psychologist, we're interested in whether or not corporal punishment or spanking influences behavioral problems. It'd be a very reasonable guess. There is a mountain of evidence to support it. Perhaps, as criminologists, we're interested in whether parenting effects influence criminal behavior later on in development. Again, a good guess. It's a mountain of evidence suggesting that these two things correlate with each other in the correlation certainly seems causal. But here's what we often ignore. Genes. And we've just seen good evidence that genetic effects are pervasive. And here's the problem. What happens if they're there and we don't look for them? And we don't control for them? Well, in 2014, my colleagues and I wanted to examine that question. In a study led by my good friend, Dr. J.C. Barnes, we examined the so what, if you will, of genetic effects. What if they're there? So what? Do they matter? Well, as it turns out, if genes influence the traits that you're interested in and you ignore them, it matters. In fact, in inject just a little bit of unmeasured genetic influence into your study and all of a sudden your findings will look very different. And in some cases, what seems like cause and effect is just an illusion. It goes away. Now, we should note that as a discipline, we've been trying very hard for decades now. We've amassed an incredible amount of knowledge regarding what correlates with crime. But that issue of unmeasured genetic influence that I just talked about, what that means in reality is that all of the knowledge we're sitting on 
could very well be one huge confounded mess until all of the studies are redone using designs like twin studies that can pull apart genetic and environmental influence we have no idea what they mean now as a field we've come to Yogi Berra's famous fork in the road we have to make a decision right? two paths are presented to us now one is the status quo we can move ahead we can do our research publish our findings fund our grants teach our students win awards maybe even influence a policy or two but that would be disastrous and I'll tell you why because going down that path will mean obsolescence it will mean that we fail to adapt to a changing scientific landscape and even worse it could mean extinction as other fields that are less hostile to biology race past us in the study of crime so what next there aren't many biosocial criminologists in the world and I think it's fair to say that we are not well regarded amongst the larger constituency of criminology but the tools that we offer and the tools that we use on a daily basis come with it or bring with it the advantage of being able to catapult ourselves into a golden age of science the new sciences of human behavior or rather of human nature behavioral genetics molecular genetics neuroscience and evolutionary psychology are the answer to the question of where we need to go next criminology simply must be a biosocial science if it hopes to survive now why does that matter more broadly well as we refine our knowledge of where crime comes from our treatments will improve our prevention efforts will get better our rehabilitation strategies will become ever more effective honing in on the true causes of crime will lead inexorably to a more humane criminal justice system just like honing in on the true causes of diseases has led inexorably to a more humane and more effective science of medicine so what are the benefits everything and who benefits everyone there's simply no reason not to be a biosocial science now is this guaranteed to be an easy road right it sounds all very rosy right now but it's not guaranteed to be an easy path in his oscar-winning portrayal of president lincoln daniel day lewis uses the analogy of a compass a compass can point you true north but it can offer you no advice about the chasms and the swamps and the deserts that you inevitably will encounter along the way biosocial criminology will encounter some pitfalls we will have to course correct but that's the nature of any science so there's no guarantee of an easy path there's no guarantee that we won't encounter swamps and chasms and deserts but despite all of that despite all of the potential problems at least we'll be headed north thank you